The Zags wasted no time adding to next year's roster, landing a commitment from all WCC first team player Michael Ajayi out of Pepperdine. What is his role? What does this mean for the rest of Gonzaga's roster? You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Want to give a quick shout out before we get into the craziness of what just happened. Want to give a shout out to Brandon, Don, and Ben. They are all three tied in the lead with 500 points in the Locked On Zags Tournament Bracket Challenge. Shout out to the three of them. We will see who is in the lead after the Sweet 16 games this weekend. We're going to get into the Zag women advancing to the Sweet 16 for the first time since 2015. They're going to take on a number one seeded Texas Longhorns in Portland on Friday. We're also going to discuss a top 10 ranked recruit in the class of 2025 who has listed Gonzaga in his top 10. But first, Michael Ajayi, the starting small forward guard for the Pepperdine Waves, one of four players, I believe, who immediately entered the transfer portal after Lorenzo Romar was dismissed. He has committed to Gonzaga. I'm going to give you a little, a little a peek behind the curtain here. I make a, a plan of what I'm hoping to do for every episode throughout the week. Obviously, change it on a, a day-to-day basis. But the plan for today's episode was to talk about Michael Ajayi because we had heard the rumor that he was going to visit Spokane. I spent a lot of time taking notes on him, uh, who he is as a player, his style, how he would fit at Gonzaga. Took all those notes, was about to hit record, checked Twitter, and saw that he'd committed. Thankfully, I had checked before I recorded. That would have been a bummer to have not been able to do that, but at least I already had the notes all ready to go. So here are those notes. Michael Ajayi, a six foot seven wing. He spent the last season at Pepperdine. It was his first Division I season, but he was a junior college player at Pierce College in Puyallup, Washington prior to this. So he only has one year of eligibility remaining. He started 33 games for the Waves, played about 35 minutes per night, averaged 17 points, 9.9 rebounds, 1.9 assists. He shot about 46.5% on two, so not a super efficient two-point scorer, but he was 47% from three. Now, that was on 2.5 attempts per game, so before we start labeling him like some elite gunner three-point shooter, he didn't take a ton of them, but it is hard to not like somebody knocking down close to 50% of them regardless of that volume. He's also a 71% shooter from the free throw line. Had a a handful of really phenomenal performances, most of them coming against some of the the not-so-good teams in the WCC. I think he had a a nearly a 30-20 game against Pacific, but he did have 31 points and 12 rebounds against UNLV, a team that uh, looked like a tournament team for huge chunks of the season this year. He had 27 points and 10 rebounds against Santa Clara. And like we said, he was all WCC first teamer in his first year in the conference. Six foot six wing comes in and immediately makes the all WCC first team. Uh, like I said, junior college star at Pierce College in Puyallup, Washington. I uh, was born in Kent, went to Kentwood High School, obvious connections to the west side of the state of Washington, perhaps uh, where some of those connections came with Romar. I don't know the specifics there, but obviously Romar spent a very long time uh, at the University of Washington, likely has connections to local coaches in the Seattle area. That's my guess as to how he got connected to Pepperdine in the first place. And you heard me say Ajayi. I want to make that clear. It is not. That is how it is pronounced, Ajayi. Uh, Gonzaga fans are going to have to get used to that because they're used to Joel Ayayi. This is different. Uh, Ajayi, we're going we're gonna to have to practice, but we're going to get better at that. Uh, against Gonzaga this year, Ajayi had 14 and 14 in the game on the road, or excuse me, at home in the McCarthy Athletic Center uh, when they played at Pepperdine and they had six points and three rebounds. That was the game where Gonzaga just absolutely put the clamps on everybody for the waves. But 14 and 14 against the Zags the last time. You got to imagine that that got some attention from Mark Few. And this is exceedingly rare. In-conference transfers happen, but they rarely happen involving Gonzaga. 
Obviously, last year we did have one Dominic Harris transfers from Gonzaga to LMU, so it's not like they have never happened before, although this is the first time I can remember, and somebody can correct me if I'm miss missing something, but first time I remember a player transferring from a WCC school to Gonzaga. It feels like that's not something that happens very often or that has ever happened in the time that I can recall at least, but the main question is what is this fit? Because we've talked about this on the podcast a handful of times. Gonzaga only has one guaranteed roster spot opening up. Now they have roster spots available already. They don't have all their scholarships filled, but they only had one player for sure departing. And that is of course, Anton Watson, who is out of eligibility after this year. There is no, no way for him to come back and play another year in Spokane as much as we'd all love to see it, but nobody else. Doesn't mean there won't be any other departures. Doesn't mean there won't be other players transferring, choosing to go to the NBA, choosing to play professionally overseas, whatever it may be. But for right now, we have to kind of operate under the assumption that the rest of the roster is still going to be here. So what does that mean for Michael Ajayi? Because he's not a four. And I don't think that the Zags are identifying him as a small ball four for a couple of reasons. One, yes, he had big rebounding numbers, but I don't think just from, from watching him eye test, uh, watching a handful of Pepperdine games this year, including against Gonzaga, he didn't play the four. Like that's not the position he plays. He's just a big jumbo guard. So they're going to want to use him as a two, three. I don't think he's going to play the four. Also, Ben Gregg is going to step into that four role. He already has. Obviously, he's playing the four right now. Watson's kind of playing the three uh, with Stromer coming off the bench. Uh, so I think he kind of fills that role more than anything else. But what does it mean for Dusty Stromer? And what does it mean for Steel Venters? Those are the big questions that are on people's minds right now. And I think that's very legitimate. Steel Venters obviously misses this entire season with an AC, ACL injury. He's, the expectation is that he's going to come back. Uh, he's still got a couple years of eligibility. I don't see why he wouldn't. Uh, Gonzaga was his dream school. He always wanted to play here. I don't get the impression that he's planning to leave after a year spent on the bench without ever getting to actually suit up for the Zags. I've also got no indication that Dusty Stromer is planning to leave, but you have to wonder, you know, what is, what's going through his head when he sees them at a player like Michael Ajayi. Now, there's definitely room for all of these guys. It's just that that kind of means Gonzaga's rotation is set. You'd have, in my opinion, and just off the cuff recording this an hour after we find out about this commitment, uh, I would think a starting lineup next year would probably be four starters from this year as well as Michael Ajayi. So you would have Nolan, you'd have Ryan Emhart and Nolan Hickman in the backcourt. You would have Ben Gregg and Graham E.K. in the frontcourt. You would have Michael Ajayi playing the three. That would bring Dusty Stromer continuing to come off the bench. I don't think the expectation was that Dusty was immediately going to start as a sophomore. I know that a lot of people have felt that and have been like, oh, is he going to even, is Venters going to come off the bench? Is Dusty going to start? Most freshmen don't start right away in year two. And I don't think that was ever really the plan for Dusty. Remember, the plan wasn't for him to start in year one. It just happened because the team didn't have a lot of depth and because of the Steel Venters injury. I think Dusty's, I think the plan is for Dusty to come off the bench. And I think that was the plan even before Gonzaga landed Michael Ajayi. Now, how he feels about that remains to be seen, but there's not been any indication that Dusty doesn't want to continue to be here. So I think that the plan is he just continues to come off the bench, whereas Steele is now also going to come off the bench, whereas I think he was probably going to start. Now, maybe they're they're wanting to bring him back a little bit slower coming off of this injury. And so they thought, hey, you know, we don't want to thrust Dusty back into a starting rotation, but we don't want Steele to have a lot of pressure on him to start and play 30 minutes a game. So this is a potential solution to both those problems. And that's totally true. And, and beyond anything else, I think this is an important detail to say. Michael Ajayi is very clearly good enough to play and play good minutes for this program. He's an extremely talented player. Six foot seven wings who can who are fluid athletes the way he is, who rebound the way he does with that toughness, that physicality, who can shoot the rock the way that he can. This is a really good player and a really good fit for Gonzaga stylistically. It's just a matter of putting the pieces together. I think this probably means Steel Venters plays more of a backup two three role where maybe he's, he is more of the backup to Hickman and Nembhard. And, and if one of those two guys is on the bench, the other one's running the point guard and Steele's kind of playing the two. And it probably pushes Luka Krinovich back a little bit in the rotation. And maybe that's, uh, you know, kind of an area that could be a little frustrating for him or for Gonzaga fans who are kind of hoping to see him take a leap. But in my my estimation is your starting lineup, like I said, E.K. Greg, Ajayi, Hickman, Nembhard. Your rotation after that is Braden Huff, Dusty Stromer, Steel Venters. Boom. That's your eight-man rotation right there. Krinovich is number nine. Uh, Yo and Sosich are 10 and 11 if they stick around. Uh, and that's that's your lineup right there. And it's pretty darn good. Now, obviously, there's a ton of offseason to go. We're not even really in the offseason. I still playing basketball. This is happening before we've even gotten to the point uh, where where we really are turning our attention to 24-25. But that's my, my kind of off-the-cuff guess at what this starting lineup is going to look like next year. 
what it means for Steele, who, who maybe just gets eased back into a bench role and then maybe gets a starting role the following year. Again, Ajayi only has one year. So after this year, Ajayi's out. Uh, I think Hickman's out. I think he's out of eligibility. I think Nemhard's out too. I think we got a big exodus uh, of talent leaving the team after this year. So that's where Venter steps into a starting role. That's where Dusty steps into a starting role. Uh, that's where maybe Braden Huff and EK start together. We'll see if they feel comfortable doing that. But that's where you start to get those guys starting to get more minutes. So I, I think that's kind of the, the where I'm at with this right now. And again, like I said, pretty crazy to land an in-conference transfer. And, and we know Gonzaga has – has already pursued other transfers as well. And I was planning to talk more about them, but at this point, I don't think that Gonzaga is heavily pursuing more players in the portal. They've been connected to Kanan Carlisle at Stanford, Roger McFarland at Southeast Louisiana, Marcus Foster at Furman, and Jacob Cruz at UT Martin. Uh, Carlisle's a little bit smaller than the rest of those guys are all six, 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 seven guard wing hybrids. Gonzaga might've got their answer in Michael Ajayi. And, and frankly, uh, last year we had transfer portal conversations all the way into August. Part of me thinks we might not be doing that this year just because I think Gonzaga kind of filled the big hole that they were planning to fill here. Now, of course, players may leave. Other things may happen between now and, you know, August potentially. And we may have some more conversations there. But for right now, this kind of put together a, a big piece in the 24-25 roster. And it looks pretty well set, uh, even as we're not really fully into the offseason yet. Well, the 2024-25 roster may be set, but 25-26 still got a lot of holes, and one of them might be filled by Jalen Harrelson, a top 2025 20, guard, uh, top 10 in the class. He listed Gonzaga in his top nine. Could he be Spokane bound after next season? We're going to discuss that. After a word from today's sponsor, Better Together, are you tired of the same old daily fantasy grind where you make a roster, cross your fingers, and hope for the best? or losing on that last leg of your pick entry? Introducing Better Together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent and you can play with your friends, not against them. Pick more or less on real-time player stats, strategize with your partner to boost your odds, and climb the leaderboard together. Better Together is the first cooperative daily fantasy application. It makes you realize that DFS is fun alone, but like a lot of things, it is better when doing it together with your friends. Better Together also gives inexperienced players an immersive way to learn about DFS. Teaming up with and following the lead of experienced friends and teammates in a team contest can take away the fear of diving in for the very first time. And for Zag fans, you need to show that you're the best players by participating in the Fan Challenge Series for a chance to win real money prizes. You can see the app for contest details. So download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code Locked On for a chance to win your share of over $1,000 in cash prizes. Remember the code Locked On because winning alone is fun, but it is better together. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is also brought to you folks by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. And Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV to provide access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's March Madness or opening weekend for baseball, which folks just right around the corner, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. I have Amazon Fire Sticks on literally every single TV in my house because I love the layout. I love the user experience. I love the remote. It's super handy. has buttons that take you directly to Prime Video, Netflix, Disney Plus, and Hulu. Fire TV also recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sporting brands all for free. And that includes us at Locked On. Go check us out ad free on Amazon Music and Amazon Fire TVs. If you have not done so yet, you need to trust me on this. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. All right, folks, segment two. Still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags. And instead of talking about our actual new player joining the roster in 24-25, we're going to talk about a prospective player who could be joining the year after that. The Zags officially in the top nine for Jalen Harrelson, a top 10 prospect in the 2025 recruiting class. He is a six foot six wing from Indiana. Again, number 10 in the on three industry ranking. I think he was number 11 at 24 seven sports. He is a consensus top 15 borderline top 10 prospect in what is considered a pretty strong 2025 recruiting class. Gonzaga makes the top nine. Here are the rest of the programs in his top nine. Again, an Indiana native. Auburn, Duke, Indiana, Kansas, Michigan State, Mizzou, Notre Dame, and Purdue. 
A lot of programs in Indiana, a lot of programs in that Big Ten, a lot of programs kind of located geographically similar to where he is. Obviously, Gonzaga stands out as the most notable counterexample. Duke, also a counterexample. Auburn is not in that same area as well. Uh, Harrelson has currently only taken one official visit. That was, in fact, to Auburn in Alabama. He has taken unofficial visits to all of the schools local to him, Indiana, Purdue, Notre Dame, and Michigan State. He did indicate in an article at on 3 Sports that he is planning to schedule other official visits. And in fact, in that same article, he was asked about the recruiting process and asked about some of the individual teams that have recruited him. He did have a specific, specific quote about Gonzaga. I'll read it here. He says, quote, their style of play stands out. Coach Stephen Gentry is the one recruiting me there. They play out a lot on ball screens, and I feel like I strive on ball screens. They also win a lot. So I just want to go to a college where I can win. If you want to win, you want to play at a high-paced offense with a lot of ball screens. It is totally, totally understandable why Gonzaga would be on your radar. It, radar. it is less obvious why, I don't know, let's say Purdue and Indiana, why those schools would be on your radar as they don't really play that same style of offense. Uh, obviously, I understand why the two local schools are on his radar. Staying close to home is always important uh, for, not always, but is frequently important for recruits. But certainly a lot of what he seems to want uh, and strive for in terms of style of play and winning basketball. Uh, he's going to win plenty at Purdue. Not as confident about how much he's going to win at Notre Dame or or Indiana uh, or Mizzou for that matter. But uh, he's definitely going to win at Gonzaga. Uh, he's definitely going to play a fast-paced, heavy ball screen action style of offense. So easy to see the fit there. Uh, he has never really been considered a particularly likely candidate to end up in Spokane. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, it's not that these recruiting services are right all the time. In fact, they are frequently wrong. And part of that is because predicting what a 17, 16, 18 year old is going to do is pretty much impossible. Having said that, the general consensus is that he's going to go to Indiana. Uh, there's some consensus that Auburn is, is kind of right in that conversation that he's probably going to land somewhere in the Midwest or at Auburn. Uh, but again, there's reasons to believe that Gonzaga could be heavily involved here, that they might be able to, to make this work for, for a young man who certainly seems to fit what they like to do stylistically. Harrelson is, is one of many targets for Gonzaga in that 2025 class. We've talked about quite a few of them. Isaiah Harwell, certainly the name you guys have heard the most in that class. He's been a target for Gonzaga for a long time, a native of Idaho, uh, playing at the Wasatch Academy in Utah, where Nolan Hickman played high school basketball. He's visited. He's an official visit. He's a top 10 player in that class. Would be a huge get for Gonzaga. Nick Kamenia is a name we've talked about quite a bit. He has taken an unofficial visit to Gonzaga and an official visit to Gonzaga. No other visit. Visits right now. He's a top 40 prospect in that class as a small forward from California. Also, Julius Halafinoa has been a target from New Zealand. Davis Fogel from Anacortes, Washington has been a target as well. There are a handful of others, uh, but those are kind of the main ones that Gonzaga seems to have been zeroing in on. But Harrelson was a guy that's been on that radar, but we haven't talked a ton about because it never really felt like Gonzaga was super close to being in the mix. But hey, they made the top nine. And, and at this point, they're still in the race. They still have some stuff to offer. Potentially, they could pull this kid out of the Midwest, bring him over to Spokane, and, and, and set him off into an offense where I think he would really thrive based on the video I've seen of him, based on the descriptions and scouting reports I've read on him, and based on what he said specifically about how he likes to operate uh, in, a, in an offense. Well, we're going to switch gears here and talk about the Gonzaga women who took down Utah and advanced to the Sweet 16 for the first time since 2015. They got a date with the number one seeded Longhorns of Texas. That game awaits them in Portland on Friday. More coming up on all of that. But first, this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. The NC State Wolfpack are obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. The team surprises all with a powerful performance, not only in the ACC tournament, they got all the way through to the Sweet 16. They're going to look to take down a Marquette team and keep the miracle season alive. They say to win life, you got to go rogue, and that's exactly what the Wolfpack have done here. So take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Today's episode of Locked on Zags is also brought to you by our friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience. That's what brings home the winning trophy and it's also what helps keep your ride or die alive. 
And eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and to level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you are into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million parts to choose from for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. Plus, with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that W. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, and eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. All right, folks, closing out the show today, talking Gonzaga women's basketball. They are still dancing in the Sweet 16. They defeat the Utes of Utah 77 to 66 at the McCarthy Athletic Center in Spokane. Four seeded Zags over a five seeded Utah. Uh, one of four teams to have both their programs in the Sweet 16. UConn, not a surprise. Duke, not a surprise. Gonzaga, in my mind, not a surprise. I think in most people's minds, probably not too much of a surprise. Shout out NC State, mentioned them in the ad read there. But yeah, the Wolfpack, two teams in the Sweet 16, good for them. Uh, but like, yeah, we got N we got North Carolina. We got North Carolina for where Duke's located. We got Stores, Connecticut. And then way over on the other side of the country in Spokane, Washington, we got the Zags. Really nice showing from them to have both these teams still dancing. Like we said, first Sweet 16 appearance for this team since 2014-15. That was Coach Lisa 48's first year. So nice for her to be able to get back into this conversation. Uh, the team is 32-3. and three. That is tied for the most wins in program history. And if they want to break that record, they just got to get by the number one team uh, in the country or the number one team in this region, one of the top teams in the country, the Texas Longhorns. Now, we'll get to that game, but want to talk a little bit more about this win over Utah. Kaylee Trung, 21.7 boards and two assists. Yvonne Ejim had a Yvonne Ejim type game, 17 points, 13 boards. Uh, but the Zags got red, red hot from three. At one point, they made nine straight three-pointers. That is obscene. That's just I mean, how do you defend that if the other team is just continuing to just cook and hitting threes every single which way? It's just impossible. At this point, after they hit their ninth straight three, the Zags had a 55-34 lead. Now, Utah whittled that thing all the way down to six in the fourth quarter. It was 67-61 at one point, thanks to Alyssa Peely, who had 35 for the Utes. She's an absolute superstar, but the Zags after letting Utah get all the way back to within a couple of possessions, they managed to hold steady, pull off the 11-point victory. It was so much fun in the kennel. The crowd was electric and energized and enthusiastic. The women's team went into the crowd to celebrate with them, high fives, hugs, sharing the love. It was an incredibly fun atmosphere to witness and experience, and, and I'm so happy that this team not only got back to the Sweet 16 for the first time in nine years, not only uh, is 48 or 40 or back in, in that conversation, but to do it at home, to tie the record for most wins in a Gonzaga single season of all time, to do it against a Utah team that there's some some emotion there. Brenda Maxwell spent three years at Utah, was a double-digit scorer for them all three years, transfers to Gonzaga, Naya Ajukwu doesn't play much for this women's team. She still also transferred from Utah. So there's some, some energy there. So I don't want to say bad blood, but there's it's, it elevated the, that conversation when the rest of the team is knowing, hey, we're playing for, for her tonight, and, and we're kind of trying to help our teammates who, who you know came here because they wanted to be somewhere that wasn't Utah. Now we got to go take them down and, and prove we're the better team, and, and that's exactly what they did here. And now they get an opportunity against Texas. 7 p.m. tip on Friday. This game will be on ESPN. The men's game, mind you, is slated to start at around 440 Pacific time, also on Friday. So we're double dipping. Friday night, man, if you're on the East Coast especially, have extra coffee. You got a 740 start time for the men's team. You got a 10 p.m. start time for the women's team. It's going to be late, but it is going to be an absolute blast. Hopefully, both those teams will be scheduled differently when they both play on Sunday. That's what we're hoping for. That's what we're going for. Uh, obviously, we'll have more about Gonzaga's matchup on against Purdue in the next couple of episodes. But I want to talk a little bit about Texas here, the Longhorns, a third-ranked team in the net 30 and four this season in the Big 12, their final year in the Big 12 before they moved to the SEC. Uh, their first two tournament games, they played a 16 seed Drexel and beat them by 40, and they beat eight seeded Alabama by 11. This is a high, high scoring offensive team. 
81.2 points per game on the season. They shoot a hair over 36% from three as a unit. Really, really dynamic offensive team. Madison Booker is their leader. 16.8 points per game for her. She also averages five assists and five rebounds, as well as one and a half steals. But they have four total players in double figures. Uh, the, the next biggest name to know for fans getting ready to watch this game outside of Madison Booker is Rory Harmon. Harmon averages about 14 points per game, as well as 7.8 assists. 14 and eight assists is ridiculous. Ridiculous. She also attacks on five and a half rebounds and 3.1 steals. That is insane levels of production for their point guard, Rory Harmon. Her and Madison Booker really going to be tough for Gonzaga. We'll see how the Trunk Twins can, can defend them. We'll see. I, I think they'll probably put Eliza, maybe Yvonne on Madison Booker. We'll see kind of how they want to match up there. But a really talented team. Really well-balanced team, really well-coached team. This is going to be a tough matchup. Now, Gonzaga does get a slight advantage by being in Portland. I, I suspect Gonzaga fans will show out well for this game in Portland. It is unfortunate that it is happening at the time that it is in the sense that a lot of fans in the Portland area will probably not want to go to the game because they'll be missing the men's game. And I think that that's just, I mean, there's just bad timing. You can't really blame anybody for that. Uh, Gonzaga's schedule is not the most important thing when they're making the this, uh, Sweet 16 schedule, so I get it. But it is unfortunate for people who want to try to go to this game in Portland or obviously people who want to go uh, see the, the men's team as well, not being able to, to get an opportunity to to at least watch the start of the women's game. Certainly you can watch the men's game and right, race off to a bar and watch the, the women's game from there. But uh, what a thing. Like, what a thing. Like, I, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining about that because I'm not, but also because – what a, I mean, what a first world problem to be having of like, oh, no, like my two teams, uh, the men's and women's team for my school are both playing on the same day in the Sweet 16 against number one seeds. That's a really cool thing that's happening and should be celebrated. I mean, this program uh, as a whole, the university is just such an incredible basketball powerhouse. The atmosphere, the energy, the enthusiasm, the ability to recruit and develop talent, the ability to keep talent, the ability to add talent like Michael Ajayi, like these two programs have built incredible, sustainable programs in ways that that are just unprecedented in all of college basketball. Like, like Gonzaga in this conversation with UConn and Duke and NC State, at NC State, I mean, no disrespect, but it's a bit fluky that they're in this conversation, but like for a small school in Spokane to be in this conversation and have it not be surprising. Like if you go on Reddit or somewhere else on Twitter and you see somebody who posted these four schools, nobody's like, wow, it's a stunner that Gonzaga's there. It's just kind of accepted as normal that Gonzaga has, you know, has two programs in the sweet 16 or that both their teams are really good. And when you just step back for like a second and think about that, it's just, it's really, really wild to be in this conversation, to be in this spot. Uh, I'm thrilled for Friday. I'm so excited to watch these two games. I'm thrilled for Gonzaga adding Michael Ajayi. I think he's an incredible talent. I think this is a really fun addition. I'm a little surprised it happened so early in the offseason, but hey, Mark Few didn't make the rules. I suspect if Mark Few made the rules, the transfer portal would not be open the day after Selection Sunday, but it is, and here we are. And they zig while everybody else zags, or maybe we should reverse that. Either way, this team has added some premier talent to the program. I'm excited to see where that goes going forward. That's going to wrap it up for us today here on Locked on Zags. I will be back with you on Thursday, getting you ready for that Gonzaga game against Purdue. We'll have more conversation in future episodes about Michael Ajayi's addition, what it means for, for Venters and Stromer and everything else as we get further into the off-season mode. But for right now, we're going to be all Purdue in the next couple episodes as we get ready for that big game. Thanks to those of you who have made this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. We will be back on Thursday with another episode. Until then... As always, go Zags.